the Spirit come upon us. And may He have full charge and full right away in this meeting. Heavenly Father, I ask for your special touch tonight. A touch that makes preaching effective. We come reliant upon you, casting ourselves at your feet in adoration and worship, knowing that you alone are able. But we're also aware of the fact that you use human beings, use us tonight. Make us channels for thy spirit. Make us golden pipes through which thy oil shall flow. Make us golden vessels full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Make us vessels unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. And grant that the ears of the people will be anointed to hear and hearts will be anointed to receive. When we shall have concluded this meeting tonight, we would leave these grounds saying it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to be here. Oh, Holy Ghost, have your full right away. I invite you tonight to take charge. Be the administrator of the affairs of this camp meeting. Be the speaker from night to night and from day to day. Speak to our hearts with all of your power and wisdom. Grant now, dear Father, for your will to be done in every particular of this meeting. And amen. If you have your Bibles, return with me to a very familiar, well-worn, much-used scripture. At least much used in yesteryear. But yet I think very apropos for this occasion. Psalm 85, 6. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revive us again. This is the Pentecostal norm for God's church. And what I mean by revival is God's people getting thoroughly right with God and with each other. Now you can't be thoroughly right with God and not be right with each other. Your vertical relationship is dependent upon your horizontal relationship. If you say that you love God and hate your brother, the Bible says you're a liar. The Bible said that. I didn't say that. So it's God's people getting thoroughly right with God and with each other. Really by revival I mean getting back to life. Romans 14 and 9 it says to this end Christ was both, uh, he both died and rose and was revived that he might be the Lord of the dead and the living. Lord of the dead and living. Here revival is talked about being back to life or coming back to life. Revival is a restoration to the life in the spirit. As the psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and this is what would happen when the joy is restored. He'd be upheld with his with the free spirit, and then sinners would be converted unto him. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Is what he's saying. That is a restoration. Then it is also a returning to the first works. The Bible said, Remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent and do the first works, else I will come unto you quickly. And remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So it's a returning to the first works. It's a returning to a baptism of love in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Literally, he said, you don't love me like you used to love me. You don't love me like you loved me before. You've lost your love for me. So it's a returning to the baptism of love in the Lord. Then it's a revisitation of God to his church. As Isaiah, when he was praying for the Lord to come down, he said, come down as thou camest down. In other words, come down like you came down in yesteryear. Come down like you came down upon the bush in Midian and it was on fire and the bush burned but it was not consumed. 
come down like you came down on the tabernacle when the cloud of the Lord covered the tabernacle and they could not minister by reason of the cloud of the glory. Come down like you came down upon Mount Sinai when it was all together on smoke and the foundation of your throne was upon top of the mountain. Come down like you came down in the temple when there was smoke in the temple and the posts of the door moved and the angels were saying, Holy, holy, holy. Come down like you did on the day of Pentecost when 120 were baptized in the Spirit and 3,000 people accepted the Lord. Come down like you came down in the Philippian jail at midnight and what you I remember the days of old. And I'm sure you have some remembrances and some reflection. I remember the days of old. This is what he said. O oh God, thou art my God, and early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, and my flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as so I have seen thee in the sanctuary. He said, I want to see you one more time like I saw you in the sanctuary. Like I saw you in your strength and your beauty. Like I saw you in your honor and your majesty. I want to see you. No doubt it was also saying, I want to see you like I saw you the day when I danced before the Lord with all of my might. I want to see you like that again. I want to see you like I saw you when the lion and the bear came into the flock. And I, by the Spirit of the Lord, have rescued the lamb from the bear and the lion. I want to see you like I saw you when I came up before the giant Goliath and in the name of the Lord he was slain. I want to see you like I saw you out on the hillside when I was playing my harp and the spirit of the Lord came upon me and I began to write the beautiful songs and to sing the beautiful songs. Now let me see you as I saw you in the days of Revival is not an act of man. It's an act of God. The Bible says in Habakkuk 3 and 2, Revive thy work. This is his work and not man's work. It is not a means of mechanism and machinery. God does not rain revival upon organization. He does not rain revival upon just the plans of men. He rains revival upon sobbing, choking hearts of confession and repentance unto Him. That's what He rains revival upon. Oh, blessed God. You see, we have a lot of substitutes for revival today. And I want to tell you, I'm just going to talk to you out of my heart this week. Bless Him, Lord. Always. We have a lot of substitutes for revival. Amen. Glory. We have seminars and conferences and retreats and yeah. prayer conferences and a lot of these things. And I'm a part of all of them. And I'm not doubting those things, but I'm telling you, we come together time and time again. We talk about revival. And we minister about revival. But revival doesn't come. And revival doesn't happen. We have prayer conferences and we don't pray. We have gatherings about revival and, and really we don't get to the heart of revival. We sort of have these substitutes for revival. We have what we call weekend meetings. W-E-A-K, weekend meetings. There is not that real yearning for revival where people said we're going to have a revival at any cost. Regardless of what the cost is. It might be a man and say, come on, fellow. We're going to have a revival. Come and stay till it breaks. I 
remember when I was an evangelist, we would go for a revival. If it didn't break the first week, we would stay the second. And, and if it didn't break the second, we'd stay the third. And we'd stay until it broke because people would fall on their faces praying for old-fashioned revival to take place. But you see, we've come to a day when revival is not the norm. Not even in the church of God. When revival is actually resisted in some Pentecostal churches. There is a resistance against revival. We have changed the emphasis from revival and evangelism to lesser considerations. You hear what I'm talking about tonight? You hear me? We have changed it to the polishing of some of our machinery. We've changed it to uh, uh, working through a lot of committees. We've got more committees and we've got commitment. We've got more diplomacy and we've got dedication. We've got more construction going on and we've got consecration in the church. Uh, there's where we are. We've come to a day when we're talking a lot about structure. I realize that there comes a time we've got to have some changes. I'm not against change, but I don't believe in change just for change's sake. I don't think the structure is where we are. I think it's a need of revival and a need for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I think that's where we are in this day. I tell you, there are a lot of things that will take care of themselves with the old-fashioned fire of Pentecost to take the call. Revival is needed 
when worldliness invades the ranks of the righteous. Revival is needed when tolerance is the order of the day instead of the message of conviction. Let us look at it for just a moment. Revival is needed when prayerlessness reigns in the church. I'm going to ask you, where are those prayer warriors that used to be identified in the church? When I was a young evangelist, I would go to churches and they would point them out to me. This person's a mother in Israel. Here's an old father in Zion over here. And they would point out that these people will be praying for you. They'll leave salty brine upon their closet carpet. Or they'll have a revival here. Where are those prayer warriors like Theodore Kyler who said, I'll have a revival in Calvary Church or we'll have a funeral in Calvary Parsonage? Where are the prayer warriors like David Brainerd who when the snow was on the ground in the forest, he prayed until he became wet with perspiration and travail for the loss of the world. Where are the prayer warriors like Jonathan Edwards who prayed all night long and then came forth with the message, sinners in the hands of an angry God, until people got up and held to the pillars of the church and said, my God, we're slipping into hell. Try to hold themselves from slipping into hell. Where are the John Fletchers who stained the walls of their study with the breath of their prayers? Where are the Wesleys who at three o'clock in the morning prayed? until fire fell upon them and started the order of Methodism. Where are the Elijahs who would pray until fire comes down or rain, whichever the occasion demands? Where is the church that will pray when they get in trouble until the angel of the Lord will come down and deliver the minister out of prison if necessary? Where is the church that will pray until the place is shaken and the power and when they prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled yet there it is I want to tell you something if I pastor the church I would have a prayer meeting uh, you wouldn't have anybody attend yes I would I'd be there. I'd be there. I'm not talking about you have to have it on Wednesday night or Friday night, some traditional night. No. I'd have a meeting that you called a prayer meeting. Amen. Whatever you had. Amen. Or you didn't do anything but just pray and seek the face of God. Until it came down upon us in a mighty, a, a glorious manner. Theodore Carter, Tyler again says, hang up a thermometer in your prayer meeting and watch the first indication of the Spirit. Hallelujah. What's the first indication of the Spirit? You see, we are going the same road that nominal churches went. We're going the same road we go. You can put your head in the sand and you can say, look at this and look at that. We're going the same road that nominal churches went. In many places we've got a name that we live, but we're dead. Because the results are not there. We have a name that we live, but we're dead. And God wants us to awaken to be a revival and a real movement of the Holy Spirit. I tell you the reason why is that we don't look at prayerlessness as a sin. We look at it as just a failure or a fault. But my Bible tells me in James 4 and 17, therefore to him that knoweth the new good and knoweth it not to him that is sin. Amen. The Bible tells me in Hebrews 2 and 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Whoa. Now that was to the saints. That wasn't Amen. to the sinner. Amen. That was to the saints. Amen. And the Bible said in 1 Samuel 12 and 23, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord Amen. in ceasing to pray for you. Amen. So you can sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray. 
You can have revivals without great cathedrals. You can have revivals without great singing. You can have revivals without a great evangelist. But you can never have a revival without prayer. It takes prayer to touch the heart of Almighty God. And you look at the New Testament and see what made the early church tick. It was prayer. When they gathered together, they prayed. When they got in trouble and being let go, they went to their own company, the Bible says. And when they got there, they didn't have any political pull. They couldn't call on the magistrates. They couldn't call on anybody to help them. But they said with a one accord, they lifted up their voice unto God. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants of all boldness they might speak thy word by stretching forth your hands to heal and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of the holy child Jesus and you know what happened and when they prayed thank God the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost there was a refilling of the Holy Ghost if I would say that the church has one great need, the greatest need we have is a refilling of the Holy Ghost. I would say that's the greatest need of our day. A refilling of the Holy Ghost. Then, we need revival when there is a lack of the manifestation of the Spirit in our midst. Now, I'm not talking about shouting and jerking and even dancing. Old Samson kept on shaking after he lost his power. And a lot of people still shaking, but they've lost it. Come on now. I'm not talking about a fleshly extravagance. I'm not talking about an emotional stir. I'm not talking about a spurious flash. I'm not talking about a spasmodic something that happens just at a high pitch. I want to tell you when you have real revival, you've got revival when you're going through the valley. You don't have to even be on the mountaintop when you've got real revival. When you've got real revival, you've got real revival when you're facing the devil in the trenches. When you've got real revival, you've got real revival when you're facing the game sayers of the world. When we get to the place that we've got fewer people in our church with the baptism of the Holy Ghost than we have those who do not have the baptism of the Holy, jo Holy Ghost, we become a nominal Pentecostal church. Amen. That means Amen. we become Pentecostal in name only. Yeah. Amen? Oh. When people say, well, uh, I'm as good as they are and they claim to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they get to make carnal comparisons and yeah. they begin to compare one another in their manifestations, then we need revival in that church. Amen? When we come to the place where the gifts of the Spirit are looked upon disparagingly, like they were in Thessalonica. Thessalonica, there had been so much sham and there had been so many people who were prophesying and not prophesying in the Spirit until they began to despise prophesying. And the Apostle Paul said, despise not prophesying. Literally there, he's talking about despise not the operation of the gifts in the church. And I believe that a church must have the operation of the gifts in order to be a Pentecostal church. You say, but Brother Hughes, I don't have the gift. Do you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, do you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost? All of the gifts are resident in the Holy Ghost. And if you've got the Holy Ghost in you, any emergency that arises, He can use you to meet that emergency. You don't have to be an ordained preacher. You don't have to be a licensed man. All you've got to do is be a believer. These signs shall follow them that believe. Hallelujah. And the church needs no wicked to the fact that God wants to use the church in the operation of spiritual gifts. I have people that come by and say, oh, I wish that some great man would come by our church and help us. Lord have mercy. He comes every service. He's there every service. The man Christ Jesus 
walks in the midst of the golden candlesticks. Go be the country for God. He is the giver of all gifts and he all gifts bestows. He dwells within the hearts of love and he is all that glows. He's there. He's here tonight. And he's ready to bestow upon you his spiritual gift. Hallelujah. Lord, help us to see him. This night I pray. You say, Brother Hughes, you mean he's given us the gifts to use at our discretion? No. Holy Ghost is sovereign. You don't carry a gift around with you like a satchel. It's positive in the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost moves upon you and there's a need, he manifests his gifts through you. I want a layman here to come up here. Anybody a layman sitting around here? Just any of you, just come here. There's no layman here. You coming, brother? All right. Come on, all three of you. It's all right. Hallelujah. People get sick in the church. It's good to call the elders, but is any afflicted? Let him pray. Amen. You pray in your own home. Many times you won't even have to call the elders of the church because, see, you've got the power in you. That's not your power. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Amen. The Bible said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He said, these signs will follow them that believe that you believe. In his name you'll cast out devils. You'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's the prerogative of the church. Churches, which were one time revival churches, it came upon them like creeping paralysis. And they didn't realize it was happening. They didn't change officially any of their creeds or doctrines. It just happened to them. It came upon them. And one day they realized it was there. And without repudiating their task, they become caught in a web of formalism. And I've talked to them and they said, we're too far gone to change. We're too far gone to change. Listen now. And there are people right within our ranks asking the question, have we gone too far? I don't believe we have. I don't believe we have. That's the reason I'm preaching now. Like I'm preaching, I don't believe we've gone too far. But if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? What can they do if the foundations be destroyed? 
than when worldliness invades the ranks of the righteous. Let me define worldliness for you. Worldliness is an attitude of the heart. Worldliness is any person, pleasure, pursuit, or place that is out of harmony with God. Amen. Worldliness is misplaced love. Amen. Amen. You can even be worldly in the pulpit if you're preaching for a purpose other than to glorify Almighty God. If you're preaching to down somebody or another preacher or to lift yourself up, it's worldliness. That's what worldliness is. And when worldliness invades the ranks of the righteous, then we need revival to come our way. Amen. I want to tell you, we've got to the place that the world is a rival to the church. You know the reason some churches can't have revivals? Because they build their local program around everything in town. Sports have become a rival to the church. You can't have a revival because of the games at the high schools. You can't have a revival because some of the programs in town, they interfere with the revival. You can't have a revival because of some of the activities that are going on. I tell you there's time that the church made an impact upon the world. Don't misunderstand me. I'm a community man when I pastor a church. But there comes a time when I say, look folks, this is revival time. Everything that you've not laying aside, I don't care what it interferes with or who it interferes with. We've got to have revival. Come on now. The world becomes a rival in the church. When things take precedence over the spirit. Amen. This is a things oriented society. Oh. Now we've got to the place where we look at material things over spiritual things. Amen. The Bible said they that are after the flesh to mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit, the things oh. of the spirit. Yeah. It said set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For you are dead your life is hid with Christ in God and when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory. You must make the things temporal serve the things that are eternal and the things that are eternal are the things of the spirit and they are the things that are unseen that can bless us. You see, when the world invades us, it strangles us and brings us down to nothingness. Amen? Then we need revival when we become tolerant to the extent that God has no place in our midst. What are you talking about, Brother Hughes? I'm not talking about being intolerant toward people. I thank God we have and the church become more tolerant toward people. The Bible said, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one the spirit of meekness, consider thyself, lest they be tempted. Brother Tyler, but for the grace of God, you and I could be among some of those that have fallen by the wayside. And I never want to forget that. I want to consider that. If that were to ever happen, oh, what a shameful thing it would be. But if it ever happened, I want somebody to put an arm around me and love me back. Love me back. That, that kind of spirit must exist in the church. We must have that attitude. I'm not talking about that. The New Testament church was a tolerant church toward people, but it was an intolerant church toward sin. Amen. You see, we have come to a place where the word tolerance sounds good. It sounds like a word of compassion. And people are saying, we're trying to be broad-minded. But in a lot of so-called broad-minded, we find it as we've destroyed the convictions of, of the people. They no longer have that strong conviction. Every man does that which is right. In his own eyes, he goes his own way. People are afraid to say anything about it. They're afraid to uphold the standard of proud against the evil of our day. They'll accommodate almost anything right within the 
the ranks of Pentecost, whether it be movies or immoral TV, or whether it be nudity in the guise of art, or four-letter words in the literature of our day, a social drinking and dancing, or whatever it might be, they will tolerate those things under the guise of Pentecost. And when you do, you'll smother the Spirit of God and you smother the operation of the Holy Spirit. last week a friend of mine told me about going out with another member of the church and they served champagne and he and his friend took the champagne he said no he said I'm ashamed of you he said not only will I not drink the champagne with you but I even refuse to eat the meal that's delivered and where is that conviction? See, social drinking is being accepted in a lot of places. Amen. Come on now, you know I'm telling you the truth. It's over. It's over. The loss of conviction tolerance. Amen. You know, there is not that keenness against evil. The Bible said in Psalm 97, 10, Ye that love me, do what to evil? Hate evil. Right. Amen. Sin is no longer repugnant to us. Sin doesn't appear exceeding sinful. We see sin, and like somebody told me when I was dealing with some terrible sins not long ago, said, can't you turn your head? I said, my God, if I turn my head, I'll have to give an account to Jesus Christ. I'll have to give an account of the judgment power of God. We can't turn our heads where sin rules and sin reigns. We must cry out against evil wherever it is. We can't license or condone. We can't endorse or cause sin to be approved in an irrespective way. There is no such thing as respectable sin. Sin is the heinous, that's criminal, that's damnable. The wages of sin is death. The soul of sin is the child Wherever sin is, revival will not rule. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now that's pretty hard for sanctified people to take. You see, but wherever there's sin, it's got to be confessed. Whosoever covereth his sins shall not prosper. But he that confesseth and forsaketh him shall I have mercy. Can you say amen? There's when revival comes. Revival is a time of confession. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of self-examination. It's a time of consecration. It's a time of looking inwardly. It's a time of looking upwardly. It's a time of clearing our hearts and purifying our hearts in the presence of the Lord. And when we get to that place, He will come and rain righteousness upon us. I wonder how many of us tonight are saying revive us again. Yes, amen. Would you raise your hand if that's your prayer? Hallelujah. Revive us again. Revive us again. I want everybody in this tabernacle who will say, I want to be an instrument of revival. And I want God to touch me for revival tonight. I want you to get up from your seat and just come and stand in the front here. Everybody here will say, I want to be an instrument of revival.
frame his holy fire. Now to Thomas. He's getting ready to do it. He's getting ready to do it tonight. I'm going to give them time. If you can't get off of the stage, just stand there where you are on the stage. That'll be all right. Just where you are. And just come right on down a little closer. You say, Brother Hughes, I want revival with all of my heart. If you do, I want to send unison right now. And please listen to me. Don't get in a hurry to move from where you are. If this night can be the night when we reach up and touch it, the rest of this week will be one grand outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen? One grand outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Would you raise your hands now? It's all right, go ahead and sing that. Hallelujah, thy Lord will make Revive us again. Oh, Father, sing revival. Watch her. 